Hey everyone, welcome to another session of Sir Razzle Dazzle Physics. In this video guys, I'm going to be doing a full revision video on the space physics topic. So let's get started. So, the Sun is our nearest star, all the planets in the solar system orbit around it. We've got the Sun over here, we've got Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. There used to be a planet called Pluto, but it got demoted. So I memorized the following, my very easy method just sums up nine planets, but obviously Pluto is not longer a planet, so you can just remove that. We have the inner planets over here and the outer planets over here, and they are separated by the asteroid belt. Orbit, when an object goes around another object in a circle, we know this is going to be experiencing circular motion. So this whole thing is called circular motion because it's moving around in a circle. Right, uh, the force pulling you to the center of the circle is called the centripetal force. For the Earth going around the Sun, we know that centripetal force is going to be provided by gravity. Gravity is going to be pulling it inwards. We can see that as the object moves around, that its velocity is changing because it's changing direction over here. So we can say that it's being pulled in one direction and being pulled in one direction over here. So that's the reason why it moves in a circle. Although the Earth is moving at a constant speed, it will be accelerating. The reason why is because acceleration is going to be a change in velocity divided by the time taken. And although it's moving at a constant speed, the reason why the velocity is changing is because the direction is constantly changing. So as you have a change in velocity divided by time taken, therefore it will be accelerating. So therefore objects moving in circular motion will be accelerating inwards. Orbital velocity. If you want to work out the orbital velocity of an object, basically it's going to be the distance traveled in one rotation divided by the time taken. So if we have the Earth going around the Sun, the distance traveled in one rotation is going to be the circumference of the circle, which is going to be 2 pi r. The time taken for it to go around is going to be the time period capital T over here. That's why to calculate the orbital velocity it will be 2 pi r divided by t, where r is the distance between the Sun and the Earth. Satellites. There are two types of satellites, naturally occurring satellites and artificial satellites. Natural satellites are going to be the planets, the moon, because the moon is a natural satellite of the Earth, the planet is a natural satellite of the Sun. Artificial satellites are man-made and they've been placed up there by the human race. Um, geostationary. Geostationary, look, the key is in the wording. Geo means the Earth, stationary means not moving. Geostationary satellites stay above the Earth in the same position. It has the time period as the time period of the Earth's rotation. So it rotates with the Earth. So let's say this is the Earth over here, my calculator. The satellite will be my hand over here. So as the Earth rotates, the satellite stays in the same position above the Earth. There we go. So it rotates in the same position. Its use will be in communication satellites because uh, let's say for mobile phones, you always want to have reception. So you always want the satellite directly above you in the same position. Polar orbits. Polar orbits are different. Polar orbits, as the Earth turns around, yes, first of all, it doesn't move with it. It actually sweeps from pole to pole. So let's say the Earth is rotating round. We can see the satellite is going to sweep from pole to pole. The reason why you want this is because it can be used to cover the entire world. Uh, it's useful in weather mapping and for spying on other countries because therefore you can actually uh, look at what every other country is doing. The life cycle of a star. So this is the life cycle of the stars that were first created in the universe. Initially there is hydrogen dust and gas. Right, then gravity acts upon it and brings it together. It starts to clump together. Eventually it takes the shape of a protostar, which is spherical in shape and the temperature starts to increase. No light is given off yet and there's not enough uh, temperature for nuclear fusion to occur. Then it becomes a main sequence star when the temperature is hot enough. And now we have the nuclear fusion occurring. Hydrogen is being fused into helium. So hydrogen fused with other hydrogen to make helium and energy is released in that process in the form of heat and light. Then from here, uh, the star will spend most of its life in this stage. The reason why is because it has a nice balance of the gravitational force pulling inwards and the force from the radiation pressure pushing outwards. Both those forces are going to be equal, hence why it has this most uh, stable phase. Then from here, from the main sequence phase, it can take two paths. The one on the left hand side is for a star the same size as our sun. It will expand out to become a red giant. Then as the hydrogen runs out, the fusion of helium occurs with lighter elements up to iron. So iron is formed over here. Then eventually the outer layer sheds off, leaving a hot white dwarf. Eventually this will cool down to become a black dwarf. So that's for our sun. Our sun will take this path, yes, over here. But if it is much larger than the sun, it will go down another path. For the larger stars, it will expand to become a red supergiant. As it becomes a red supergiant, yes, 
what will happen is the hydrogen will run out again, and yes, we'll get the fusion of the heavier elements up to iron. Yes, the helium fusion occurs here. Then it will contract very rapidly, and what will happen is a violent explosion will be observed called a supernova. This is where the elements greater than iron are being fused. So when you find uranium, the uranium is not formed anywhere else except from the supernova. Now it is formed in a supernova, it is then scattered across the universe. And then from here it can even become a neutron star, over here, which is a density packed star, or it can become a black hole, which has a very strong gravitational pull that even light cannot escape it. The formation of our solar system and planets, so how is our sun formed? Our sun is not the same as some of the stars which were previously created because we actually have hydrogen at the start, but we also have heavier elements from supernova explosions from earlier stars. So earlier stars obviously made these heavier elements and now our sun is going to be formed from the remnants of dead stars. So look over here, now we have all the elements clumped together once again to form a protostar over here. And look, we can see that not all of it clumps together, but what's gonna to happen to all the material that's not clumped together? Hopefully you can recognize that those bits which have not clumped together will then clump together themselves. So the dust clouds which were not used in the formation of the star now clump together due to gravity and these will form the planets and that's how we have the planets. Note that there are heavier elements still in these, so you get the heavier elements in these uh, planets being formed. Uh, the inner planets of the solar system have solid surfaces because they are made up of heavier, denser materials like iron or uranium. Gravity is stronger, close to the sun, hence why these heavier materials can be easily brought together. The outer planets are called gas giants. This is because the gas substances contracted together further away from the sun. That's the reason why we have the gas giants further away. The Doppler effect. So let's say, for example, we have an ambulance over here. We have a person behind it and a person in front. Initially, if the siren is turned on, you would hear the same thing from both sides. Same thing from both sides because the waves are coming out equally. But what happens when the ambulance starts to move on one, to one side? So when the ambulance starts to move to this side over here, what will happen is these waves get bunched up. So the person on the right will have a higher frequency. So the person on the right will observe a higher frequency and a shorter wavelength. It is a shorter wavelength because the distance between each one is shorter. The person behind watching it leave is going to experience a lower frequency because the wavelength has been stretched out. This is known as the Doppler effect. The apparent change in the frequency and wavelength of a wave due to the relative motion of the source, in this case it's the ambulance, and the observer is known as the Doppler effect. So make sure that you understand it's due to the relative motion of the source and the observer. So it depends on where you are. Yes, if it's moving towards you, high frequency, in moving away from you, it's going to be a low frequency. Now, we are going to use our understanding of the Doppler effect when we're talking about light. Right, so first of all, this is the visible light spectrum. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Yes, Richard of York gave battle in vain. One side, we're gonna call the left-hand side the red side, and the right-hand side is going to be called the blue side for now. So we've got the left-hand side, and the right side is going to be called the blue side. Right, now from here, we're gonna say that white light has an equal distribution of all the wavelengths, so we're gonna put it right bang in the middle. It'll be like the average. So imagine that red line over here. I'm gonna use this red line to explain a concept in a minute. So just for now, just accept that the red line represents white light. Now, let's talk about galaxies. So let's say a galaxy is going to emit white light. Yes, over here. Right, if the galaxy is stationary, yes, it emits white light. But then if the galaxy is moving away, we notice from the Doppler effect that the wavelength will increase. Yes, the waves get stretched out. The wavelength increases and the frequency drops down. Now, because the white light has increased in wavelength, what will happen to the white light over here? Well, obviously, if you've increased in wavelength, you have shifted to the red end of the spectrum, hence why we call it redshift. So the white light increases in wavelength, therefore shifting it to the red end of the spectrum. That's why it's called redshift. So if a galaxy is moving away from us, we can see that the wavelength has increased. The white light is shifted to the red end of the visible light spectrum. This is therefore called redshift. And the opposite then. So what happens if we observe a galaxy and we, the galaxy is moving towards us? Hopefully you can see that the wavelength has decreased. If the wavelength has decreased, the white light will shift to the blue side of the spectrum because the wavelength has decreased. So the white light shifts to the blue side of the spectrum. So therefore we can say that the white light is shifted to the blue end of the visible light spectrum. We call this blue shift. So make sure you understand the idea of red shift and blue shift in terms of the Doppler effect and how the wavelength is changing. Due to the motion of the galaxy, 
relative to the observer. So how do we actually see redshift and blue shift? Well, we can see them via absorption lines. Basically, uh, this is a spectrum. On one side, it's red. One side, it's blue. Yes, it's going across the entire color spectrum. And we have these black lines over here. The black lines are basically like a fingerprint for that galaxy. Right, so the one in the middle is not moving. That's the reason why they have lines like this. But the one above is an absorption spectrum from a galaxy moving away from us. The key thing to note is that, as you can see, that if the stationary galaxy has lines like this, and the one moving away from us, what's happened to all those lines? Look, they've been all shifted. This one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. They've all been shifted to the red end of the spectrum, hence why we know this is going to be redshift. And look, the one at the bottom over here, relative to this one over here, we can see that all the lines have been shifted to the blue end of the spectrum, hence why this one is going to demonstrate blue shift. So by looking at the absorption lines, we can determine if it's going to be redshift or blue shift. Redshift and expanding universe. Right, so if we were to plot a graph of the velocity of the galaxy in kilometers per second on the y-axis and the distance of the galaxy from Earth uh, on the x-axis, we will know that the galaxies furthest away are moving off the fastest. Uh, and therefore, they will exhibit the greatest redshift. Sometimes when you're looking at these questions, they might have the unit of the light year. The unit of the light year is not a measure of time. It is a measure of distance. It is a measure of the distance traveled by light in one complete year. In order to calculate the value of one light year, I'm going to take the speed of light and times it by the number of seconds in a year. So the speed of light is 3 times by 10 to the 8 meters per second. Therefore, I'm going to times it by 60 by 60 times by 24 times by 365, which is going to be the total number of seconds in a year. Then my answer will be 9.4 times by 10 to the power of 15 meters. So yes, one light year is equal to 9.4 times by 10 to the power of 15 meters. Pause the video and check my calculation to just make sure that you understand how we calculate that. A little bit of extra information over here that we know that the velocity is proportional to the distance and therefore that there's a constant which relates to both of them. That constant is going to be called Hubble's constant. The gradient of the line is going to be one divided by time. So therefore, to work at the time of the universe, if you rearrange this formula, t is equal to one divided by the gradient of that line, where t will be the time of the universe. So if they give you this graph and you're asked about the time of the universe, it is basically one over the gradient of this line. So what does redshift tell you about the universe? Well, from Earth, every galaxy which is observed, you will be able to observe redshift. So redshift is observed from every single galaxy. So obviously if redshift is observed, that tells you that all the galaxies are moving away and therefore the universe is expanding. The Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang Theory is the most accepted theory based upon the evidence on how the universe began. The Big Bang Theory states that from one point of singularity, a giant explosion of energy occurred and the universe was created and has been expanding ever since. There are two types of evidence supporting the Big Bang. The first one, which we just covered, is going to be redshift. You observe redshift from distant galaxies. This shows you that the universe is expanding. The other bit of uh, data to help support the Big Bang theory is going to be the detection of CMBR, which is going to be cosmic microwave background radiation. It's basically the leftover radiation from the initial Big Bang, so the leftover radiation. The fate of the universe. Right, so we don't understand how the universe is going to end, but currently if we plot a graph of the size of the universe versus time, we're roughly over here. We recognize that it can go down the possible route of the big yawn, it continues to increase in size, or it goes down to the big crunch, maybe it will collapse back inwards on itself over here, we're not too sure. Unknown aspects of the universe. So the universe is actually expanding at an accelerating rate. Because it is expanding at an accelerating rate, Physicists are not too sure what is responsible for this expansion. They have called it dark energy because they are not too sure what it is that's causing the acceleration in the expansion of the universe. Dark matter. So here we have a spiral galaxy over here. And what should be happening is that for the spiral galaxy, which is notice that uh, these stars over here should be moving a lot slower than the ones in the middle. So the ones in the middle should be moving much faster than the ones at the end. The reason why is because these ones are closer to the center, so gravity must be acting at the strongest, therefore causing them to move faster. But when astronomers actually looked at the data, they noticed that if you plot the graph of velocity versus distance from the center of the galaxy, that yes, it should have actually dropped down, the velocity should decrease as you get further out, but the velocity never decreased. It actually stayed the same. So the velocity of these ones is roughly the same as the velocity of these ones over here. So the velocity of the stars further out is much higher than expected. Therefore, there must be some extra mass somewhere which is causing this extra gravitational pull. 
we are going to call this dark matter. Physicists do not really understand it because dark matter does not give out any electromagnetic radiation. And that's it for another session of Sarazzle Dazzle Physics. If you want me to go through any of the content at a slower rate, then if you click on my description below, you'll actually see that I've got a playlist dedicated to the space topic. If you're still unsure about any of the concepts, comment below and I'll do my best to solve your problems. And if you're looking for more content on GCSE or A-level physics, you can check out my YouTube channel, which I've got tons and tons of videos to help you with your studies. Ciao, ciao, and goodbye, and good luck.